everybody says, uh, he's actually from Harvard right now. Um, and he started out in Columbia, an undergraduate, uh, did an PhD with uh, Lenny Dustin at Stanford, um, and then was in Uh, and we'll be joining the MIT faculty uh, next fall. So, uh, that is, is uh, a synthesis of, uh, well, many extraordinary qualities, one of them being that uh, it was probably one of the youngest graduate students that ever came to my attention was not at my own institution. Um, by asking uh, incredibly insightful questions that I was teaching and embarrassing. Um, and he found that and in ways that have been delightful. Uh, he's uh, talking about microbiology. Um, he's been one of the most influential minds on the question of firewalls and how to resolve the black hole paradox, uh, working with Patrick Hill at Stanford. And most recently, uh, he has seriously convinced me that he should care about quantum error correction. I care about quantum error. And that's, um, that's what we'll be hearing about. Today, but I think he's definitely one of the people that uh, have this ability of speaking the language of quantum information theory and speaking the language of theory and quantum gravity and bringing those communities together and helping uh, develop them. Great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Joel, uh, for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be back at Berkeley. Um, I, I want to say before I begin uh, that. Um, this talk, I think, should be accessible. Oh, that's dark. Um, that, that's how you want it? Or? <laughs> OK. Um, so I, I think the talk should be accessible to pretty much everyone. Um, but you know, I, I understand that the material isn't always totally familiar. So I, I, if you have questions, if there's, a, if there's something that I said that you didn't quite understand, um, I don't, feel free to raise your hand during the talk. Uh, and I, I'm happy to take questions during the talk. I, I, if, there be, if there become too many, we might have to uh, clamp down on it, but I think at least a few, uh, it helps uh, make sure everyone's on the same page. All right, so today I'm going to talk about um, emergent locality and gravity um, from quantum error correction. Uh, I guess probably for most of you, it's, uh, these things sound like they should have nothing to do with each other, so uh, if by the end of the talk I convince you that they have something to do with each other, uh, uh, we can probably call it a success. Um, Let's start with some perspective, though. So, so, so I'm a quantum gravity theorist. I'm trying to figure out quantum gravity. Um, this is an old problem. You know, at, le at least 60 years, there have been people who've been thinking fairly seriously uh, about the subject. Um, the initial attempts to do quantum gravity, uh, I would say, were not particularly successful, um, although they did lead to a, a lot of useful things that we still use. Um, the initial attempts were based on trying to quantize the metric as a field, to try and make a field theory of quantum gravity. Um, now, uh, starting in the 70s uh, with uh, Shirk and Schwartz, uh, and then later other people, um, people realized that trying to think about gravity in terms of strings uh, works better than thinking about it in terms of fields. Um, although ultimately these methods were still restricted to perturbation theory. So they weren't real theories of quantum gravity, but they're at least closer to theories of quantum gravity than people were able to do with metrics. Um, and then finally, in the last 20 years or so, um, we've at last seen real, you know, non-perturbative, you know, mathematically well-defined theories of quantum gravity. Uh, which go by the name of the BFSS matrix model uh, and the ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, now, these two theories have this rather surprising feature that the microscopic description of the theory lives in a different number of space-time dimensions than the gravity theory that we're trying to describe. Um, so, for example, this BFSS model uses matrix quantum mechanics um, to describe 11 dimensional flat space. So, you know, it uses a zero plus one dimensional theory, just the quantum mechanics of matrices, to describe an 11 dimensional gravitational theory. 
And then perhaps more famously, this ADS CFT correspondence, um, well, then it uses a conformal field theory in, in D space time dimensions to describe gravity in at least the D plus one dimensions, uh, perhaps more. Um, so uh, now I should just comment uh, that, you know, okay, these two theories are great and, and we're gonna be discussing this one a lot today. Uh, not, neither of these are realistic theories of quantum gravity. Uh, this one, well, there's this 11 there, right? It's a little embarrassing. Uh, and, and this one, well, ADS, AD, ADS means that the cosmological constant is negative. Uh, and as you probably know, our cosmological constant is positive. Um, so, you know, okay, these are good, you know, still to think about. I mean, at least some questions about quantum gravity uh, shouldn't depend on, you know, what's the sign of the cosmological constant or how many dimensions do we live in so we can learn something. Um, but, you know, in, in the end, right, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not trying to declare victory here. I mean, still, still we, in the end, we need to understand how to do realistic uh, quantum gravity. But for the purposes of the talk, uh, that's too ambitious. Um, so we're just going to think about this. And in particular, we're just going to think about ADS CFT. Now, when you hear about this holography um, for the first time, you probably have a few questions. Um, first of all, why should this be true? What's so special about gravity? Isn't gravity just one of the four forces? When we were doing electrodynamics, when we turned it into quantum electrodynamics, we didn't change the number of space-time dimensions, and we didn't change it for quantum chromodynamics either, or for the electroweak theory. So why in the case of gravity do we have to do this crazy stuff? Okay. And this is not a stupid question, this is a good question. And even once you've been convinced of that, how can this be true? That's ridiculous, right? How can a theory in a higher number of dimensions be equal to a theory in a lower number of dimensions? I mean, I, I'm pretty convinced that I'm living in three plus one space-time dimensions right now. Uh, you know, and, and I should emphasize that you know, it's not like in string theory where we say there's like some extra small extra dimensions curled up that we don't see. I mean, here, it's, we're really talking about the large number of dimensions is d plus one. And in the microscopic theory, the large number of dimensions is d. Okay, so shouldn't we be able to tell? I mean, come on, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 and we're gonna discuss much more about this. I'm just like, giving the outline here, but we'll, we'll review ADS-CFT in a sec. Um, so, um, what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to review the answer to the first question. So, so, so what's different about gravity and why do we need to do this stuff? Uh, and then I'm going to present um, a new and I would say more precise answer to the second question. So how in the case of ADS-CFT do we get this extra space-time dimension? Where did it come from? Uh, uh, the talk will be based mostly on, on this paper with um, Ahmed Almeri and Shidong. Uh, and then um, I'll also, uh, in the end, mention some work with these people. So I just, so this, we love the acronym for this paper, so I had, I had to put it here. Um, okay. Now, first, okay, what's different about gravity? Well, what's different about gravity is that it's universal. Everything gravitates. And because everything gravitates, it means that we can have black holes, right? Because black holes are, are regions where the curvature of space-time is so strong that nothing can escape. But it's only because everything gravitates that that's true. If you had something that somehow didn't gravitate, then it wouldn't care about the curvature of space-time because that's gravity, and then it would just be able to get out anyways. Okay. And I want to emphasize that when I say the existence of, of black holes, I don't mean like the existence of black holes in my equations or on, on, my, on my blackboard. I mean, look, these are black holes, right? So, so this, is, this is the jet coming out of the galaxy M87. Uh, it's coming out of an active galactic nucleus here, which is a huge accretion disk going into a black hole whose mass is something like 10 to the 10 solar masses. Uh, and then this is this amazing uh, discovery um, from LIGO uh, last winter, uh, where, where, where you, this is the gravitational wave signal of the collision of two black holes. Um, so these are really here. Th these are things we need to understand. You know, it's not like some particle I made up because I hope I, I would see it at the LHC, right? I know this is here. Uh, 
and, and I need to understand it. Now, classically, we understand black holes quite well. And, I, and maybe the best argument for that is just this plot right here. So you see, you see the, the, the lines here are theory, computed from general relativity, and then the shaded thing is the data from LIGO. And, and it fits, right? fits pretty well in a, in a rather strong field regime of general relativity. But quantum mechanically, uh, we still find black holes very confusing, uh, and it's because of that that we need to do holography. Now, why is that? Well, the problem is that, the problem with black holes is that they prevent us from defining um, the usual kinds of observables that we use in quantum field theories, um, like quantum electrodynamics. Um, quantum electrodynamics, the theory of, quantum theory of electrodynamics. Um, and it's so easy to understand this that I'll just do the calculation here for you on the board, well, or on the slide. So um, if we want to define local observables, well, we need to say where they are, right? And so usually when we talk about doing that, we use some sorts of rods and clocks or so on, you know, to say where everything is. So let's say here we want to, so here I'm going to make a, a network of rods filling space. And then because I'm going to do quantum gravity, I'm going to try and have the, the lengths of the, the individual rods be of order the Planck scale, okay, which is the natural length scale of, of, of quantum gravity. Uh, it's a short length scale, you know, 10 to the minus uh, 33, uh, Oh, now I forget whether that's meters or centimeters, but it doesn't matter too much at that point. Um, and so, okay, I drew this as two-dimensional, but it's really three-dimensional. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to try and try and use this network of rods, you know, to say, oh, I want to I want to measure the operator in you know the 27th row and the 36th column or something like that. Okay. But so when I do that, there are some constraints that my network of rods needs to obey. Um, one constraint is that my network of rods better not collapse into a black hole, okay? I'm trying to use it to say where things are, and if the whole thing just collapses into a black hole, it's going to make it difficult for me, well, to do the, never, the experiment, certainly, and never mind to, to re report the experiment out to, you know, the APS or whatever after I finish doing it, because I'm going to be inside the black hole, too. Um, so if I don't want to be a black hole, well, what I need is that I need the, the linear size of this thing has to be bigger than the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, of this whole collection of things. Um, so, okay, the Schwarzschild radius is just G times M. Uh -huh. Now, um, G is L Planck squared, or here I've written it as L Planck over M Planck. Uh, the number of rods is L over L Planck cubed, right, because I have a cube worth of these things. Uh, and then the mass per rod is this, right? So M is this thing times M rod, and G is L Planck over M Planck. And then, well, we can look at this inequality. I can move the L plank over here to the denominator. I can cancel it off here. I want this thing to be large because I want there to be a lot of rods. But then you see I want it to be small here, which means I need this thing uh, to be very small, which means I need the, rod, the mass of each rod to be very small in plank units. Okay, that's what I need if I, if I don't want my rods to collapse into a black hole. Now, in classical general relativity, there's nothing wrong with that. I can have that. Okay, just make the rods light. The Planck mass is big, after all. Um, but there's a second constraint. I also want to know where the rods are. So I also want to know where the rods are. And since we're doing quantum gravity, there's the uncertainty principle. So um, in particular, um, I need the length of each rod, which is L Planck, um, you know, to be large compared to the uncertainty and where the rods are. Otherwise, otherwise, I just don't know where the rods are. Um, but as we know, delta x has got to be bigger than 1 over delta p. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And delta P, well, that's basically the mass of the rod times delta V. And I want the rods to be non-relativistic, so delta V should be less than 1. So I can forget about it in this inequality. So this just has to be less than 1 over M rod. And then, hey, look, now that means the rods need to be heavy in Planck units. OK, and you see I'm not going to be able to do both of these things at the same time. So, and I, I want to emphasize, this is really why quantum gravity is hard, right? This is why we can't do quantum field theory of quantum gravity. You know, if we try to define these kinds of local observables, we can't both, you know, have it be a weak perturbation to the gravitational field and know where the rods are because of the uncertainty principle. Um, 
I think this tension is most sharply illustrated by looking at the, this famous formula, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for the entropy of a black hole. Right, so, so Bekenstein and Hawking, they told us that the entropy of a black hole is the area of the horizon in Planck units divided by 4G. And the thing that's interesting is this is not extensive, right? So if you look at the entropy of like an oven or something, you know, the, the entropy of an oven grows with the volume of the oven. And really in any quantum field theory, or if you like any lattice system, you know, a bunch of spins filling some lattice or something, you know, the number of states is extensive. It grows, grows with the volume in any, in any local theory. But here you see it, it, it's sub-extensive. It grows only with the area. Um, so, so roughly speaking, um, you know, in holography, the reason why we need this lower number of dimensions is because if we had the, you know, the microscopic theory was local in the same number of dimensions as the gravity, then, then we would have more entropy than that. We would exceed uh, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Uh, so, you know, for these kinds of things, I just want to mention, since Raphael's here, he has a, he has a nice review about these things, about the holographic principle, which you, sh you should all read if you're curious about this. Um, of course, I, I also say that whenever you're not here, Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so, so that's, that's the why of holography. Okay, that, that's why quantum field theory isn't gonna cut it, and that's why we have these other holographic theories. So now the rest of the talk, we're gonna try and understand how these holographic theories are working. Um, so, and I'm just gonna do ADS-CFT. ADS-CFT is gonna be enough for us. And I'm not gonna assume you know ADS-CFT, now we're gonna learn ADS-CFT. So here's ADS-CFT. Um, it says that quantum gravity in asymptotically anti-de-sitter space is equivalent to conformal field theory on the boundary of asymptotically anti-de-sitter space. So let's unpack that statement. So here's asymptotically anti-de-sitter space here. Uh, you can think of this like, a, like the soup can, okay? Uh, we have, uh, um, I've drawn it in two plus one dimensions because I'm graphically challenged. So, but see the gravity is living inside the can here. There's a radial direction and there's time is going up and there's this angular direction and there's us in the center. And then the funny thing, about, and, and then G is not zero, that's very important, so there's gravity <laughs> going on in there. Uh, and then the funny thing about anti-de Sitter space, well, so in anti-de Sitter space, the cosmological constant is negative. Now, were the cosmological constant positive, that's probably what most of you are more familiar with, right? That's what causes the accelerated expansion of the universe, right? The cosmological constant is positive. So when the cosmological constant is negative, you get kind of the opposite thing. So say you're sitting here in the center of anti de Sitter space and you take this clicker and you throw it away from you. Well, with a positive cosmological constant, it would just fly away, accelerating faster and faster and you never see it again, okay? But with a negative cosmological constant, the craziest thing happens. It goes out for a while, but then it turns around and it comes back. And uh, after a time, which is avoided the radius of curvature, you, it comes right back to you and you catch it. And it's true even if instead of throwing the laser pointer, I point the laser pointer, Right, so, so now, now it's photons, they're going at the speed of light, so that's like one of these here. It goes out to the boundary, it bounces off, and it comes back, and then after this time, you, you shot yourself in the eye with the laser pointer. So, 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 so life in anti-de Sitter space is quite funny, you know, Every, everything is a boomerang in anti-de Sitter space, even a photon. Um, now, um, that's, so that's the soup. Anti-de Sitter space is the soup, uh, the can is the conformal field theory. So the idea is now on this, on this boundary here, so now we get rid of the radial direction, we just have this angular direction in time, and g is not equal to zero, and now the theories are equal. And so if you, if you like equations, here's some equations. So this is the metric of anti de Sitter space. So this L here is a length scale, and so that's the radius of curvature. And so if I take L to infinity, Right, then this goes away and this goes away and it just comes in Minkowski space and polar coordinates. But then if L is finite and then I take R to be large, then I can get rid of the ones here. And this just becomes, the boundary here is this, is this sphere here time, times time. So it's the cylinder. Okay, so that's the, that's the can, the, the metal of the can. Now let's say a little bit more about how that works. So here, here's the same picture drawn again. Here I've, I've used Escher to illustrate the, the spatial geometry at a fixed time. So, so, so at a fixed time in anti-de-sitter space, you have this kind of hyperbolic curvature going on. Um, 
And, and this is really supposed to be a quantum statement. So it means that if I give you a state in the Hilbert space of the quantum gravity theory, say on this Escher time slice here, then it maps to a state in this ring here, which is a time slice of the boundary conformal field theory, and vice versa. If I give you a state in the conformal field theory Hilbert space, then it maps to a state of the quantum gravity theory on this disk. Um, similarly, operators map to operators. So the Hamiltonian on this side is the Hamiltonian on that side. They have the same spectrum, same eigenvalues and degeneracies. And the same for the rotations of the sphere uh, and the other symmetry generators. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a, a little more subtle line in the dictionary, which is that well, okay, so here, so in here I have at least to some approximation, I have something like local effective field theory going on in the bulk. I could imagine thinking about a field, you know, say the electric field at some point in the bulk, although here I've, here I've drawn a scalar field. Um, and then if I, if I take this field, and, and so remember these coordinates R, T, and omega are, ju are just these coordinates. So R is this radial coordinate, time and, and angle. Um, if I move the operator to the boundary, so like say it starts here and I move it all the way to r equals infinity, then, well, now it becomes an operator that depends only on t and omega, and actually it, it becomes a local operator in the conformal field theory. And so, so that's the sense in which you think of this as sort of living at the boundary, right? I take a local thing here, I pull it to the boundary, and it becomes a local operator at that point on the boundary. Um, we can also say a little bit more about how the states map into each other. Um, so, so low energy states in this conformal field theory correspond to perturbations of the vacuum in anti de Sitter space. So, you know, you can have gravitons zipping around, planets, people, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and then high energy states in the CFT correspond to black holes uh, in the bulk. And we'll see a little bit more about that later. Um, so these are just sort of the, the standard basic rules of how the correspondence works, right? We have the same Hilbert space, you know, and we're just, we can either think about it in this kind of language, or we can think about it in that kind of language. Uh, and of course, the nice thing about that is that in this one, right, we had, we had G equals zero, so then we don't have to think about quantum gravity, right? And that's good, because quantum gravity is confusing. So we, we've taken something we don't understand, and, and we've said it's exactly equal to something that we do understand. Um, now, using these rules, we can immediately think about things like scattering experiments in anti de Sitter space, right? So you can, you can make a little perturbation here and a little perturbation there, and you can send them in, and they interact, and stuff comes out. Uh, and in the conformal field theory, this is just some correlation function of these local operators in, in the boundary conformal field theory using, using this, this map here. Um, but so, so that's all well and good. Um, but you know, you might say, okay, well, come on, Harlow. I mean, you look here. You know, here, here, here. You only told me about stuff in the bulk that's near the boundary. But okay, that's boring. What if you're what if you're right in the center, right? Isn't that isn't that really what we should be thinking about? You know, how how in the CFT do you describe what's going on in the center? I mean, because that's really the question of where this radial dimension comes from, right? Like if here I kind of got rid of the radial dimension. So 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 then so then so far this kind of doesn't really help with figuring out. Where did that extra dimension come from? Which is which is the thing we're really trying to understand here. Um, and and I should say also that that understanding how to describe what's going on in the center is important if we're going to want to generalize this to you know things where lambda is not negative and things like that. Right? I mean clearly clearly we want to if we're going to understand quantum gravity, we should be able to think about it directly in the center. Um, okay. So indeed in ADS CFT um, there is a proposal for how to represent these local bulk fields, uh, not, not at the boundary, but in the center of the bulk, um, also as operators acting in the conformal field theory. Uh, so I won't explain the details. It's kind of technical, and it's not that interesting. But here's the rough idea. So see this x here, now it's a point in the center of the bulk. Okay. And then you can do some analysis that these people explain, and you'll convince yourself that this operator here has a CFT representation which looks kind of like that. So the idea is there's some function here, this k, which depends on a bulk point and on a boundary point. And then I integrate the boundary point over some region, which I've shaded in green here in the CFT. Uh, 
against some, this local operator, O of x, um, which is the same local operator that we had uh, appearing here. Um, and this is called global reconstruction, because the idea is that wherever this operator is in the bulk, this expression in the CFT uses, uses this field at sort of all the points on this ring uh, at once. So, so it's a rather complicated operator. You know, it's, it's certainly not, this is not a local operator in the CFT. It has support sort of everywhere. You know, if, if you allow yourself to use time evolution, you can think of it as having support everywhere on the boundary. Um, now, I know this, is, this may be a bit much. You know, I'm throwing all this ADS CFT at you at once. I promise there's only one more thing that we have to learn. And then, uh, and then we'll be in good shape uh, to start uh, learning new stuff. Um, so the last thing I have to throw at you, it's not that different from this. Um, it's, it's called subregion reconstruction. And so the idea is um, sometimes if I have a, a bulk field here at this point x, you know, floating in the middle of the bulk, you know, the electric field at that point or something like that, right? It's an operator in the Hilbert space. Um, well, so here, I could use this, and that would give me a representation of it on this whole green region here. But sometimes there's a smaller representation of it in the CFT, which only uses this green region, okay? Which is why, so it's called subregion reconstruction. You're reconstructing it just onto a subregion. You're giving it a CFT representation on a subregion. And the formula looks basically the same. It's just now the integral is over this D of A, this, this green diamond here, which is living on top of a subregion A. Um, okay, and, and th these should be the same. Don't worry about why, but if you know what these words mean, then that's why. Yeah. Uh, good, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so N is basically the number of fields in the CFT. So uh, in ADS CFT, 1 over N is basically G Newton. So, so the number of fields in the CFT is related to the strength of gravity. So when N is large, G is small. Uh, now, technically, G is not dimensionless, so I mean G in ADS units is small. W. What? W. W. Oh, yeah, sorry, I, sh sorry, I should have defined that. So W is the region in the bulk which is inside this wedge. So you see these dashed lines here? There's kind of a wedge of cheese which is in between this black line here and these dashed lines. And that's called the, that's called the reconstruction wedge of A. Uh, so it's basically saying that if the field is inside of this W of A, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have labeled it, then it has a representation in the CFT like that. And actually, this is important enough that, that I'm going to explain it again, just, just in a way that hopefully is more clear to everyone. So, so now I'm going to take this picture, and I'm just going to look at it on this time slice in the center here, right? So we have this disk here with this curve, and now we're just going to flip it up like that. Um, so then the idea is this, this red shaded region here is the wedge associated to A. Right, so it's the area inside this wedge here. And then the idea is that if the field is in this red region, um, then it has a representation on A. But if it's not, then it doesn't. Now you could say, how did I know the red region? Well, there's a simple rule, I, I won't explain it, but the idea is you just draw this geodesic here. So this is a circle segment here. So given your region on the boundary, here it's this interval, I draw a geodesic that connects the two edges of the interval together, and then, and then everything inside that is in, this, is in the wedge. Um, so, and, and really, you just need to remember this picture. You can, you can pretty much forget everything else I said. So we have this disk. We, want, we have operators that are in various points of the disk. We want to know if the operator has a representation on a boundary subregion. So we take the subregion, we draw this curve, and then we see inside or out. <laughs> OK, that's all you need to remember. Um, but, you know, how, how can this, right, I mean, remember we had this puzzle, right? Where did this extra dimension come from? I mean, somehow these formulas that I'm writing know about this extra dimension because now I can move this operator into the center. Um, but, but, you know, the CFT is, is lower dimensional. So, so, so you know, how, how am I able to do that, right? You know, again, I haven't really answered the question of where the extra dimension came from. Um, so here's now, at the end of this long introduction, what we're going to do in the rest of the talk. Um, we're going to introduce a few paradoxes that I would say sharply formulate the tension between having a, a low dimensional theory be equal to a high dimensional theory, right? I mean, intuitively it seems crazy, but we'll try to say a little more mathematically why it's crazy. Um, I'll then explain how the theory of quantum error correction, which I'll also have to introduce, um, gives a loophole 
to the tension in these paradoxes. I'll explain how that loophole is available only if the bulk theory is gravitational, so that gravity is an essential element in having a theory in one number of dimensions be equal to a theory in another number of dimensions. Um, and then to, to try to keep things interesting and not have anybody get bored, um, I'm gonna, as we go along, I'm basically gonna illustrate all this stuff by using examples, you know, simple examples, just to make sure that everyone uh, is on the same page. Okay. So any more questions about ADS CFT? And then, yes. So uh, when you pull back the operator response to the operator, uh, the operator is exactly at the center of the rainbow point of zero, how do you pick which direction? Um, uh, well, you, you, I mean, you can put it good. So there's a, the, the coordinate system with the R and the angle breaks down at the center. So, so in the center, we just, you know, we say, okay, it's in the center. And then as soon as it's away from the center, then we know where it is. But the, the, the machinery I was talking about is okay if you use, you can use other coordinates where the center is in special, and then you don't have this, this little puzzle. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, one more question, yeah. Well, it's, no, it's more than that, though, because I really want to access the data in the operator. I want to measure it and know what's the probability distribution for getting one result or getting the other. So it's more than just, you know, is it influenced or not? Yeah. Oh, all right, fine, one more. So I think it's a topological problem, right? No, 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 it's okay. No, I, I don't think there's any topological uh, obstruction. I think the, the, the cylinder is uh, sort of simply connected and so on. Right? It's all its homology classes are trivial. Um, all right, so, so ne yeah, so I, I should move on. Um, and now, now I'll start introducing the paradoxes. Okay. So I want to remind you that in quantum field theory, um, causality is enforced by commutativity at space-like separation, okay? In quantum field theory, if you have two local operators and they're space-like separated, they commute as operators on the Hilbert space of the quantum field theory. And this is really essential, okay? Because if that were not true, then measuring one of the operators or not would influence the results of what you would get by measuring one of the other operators. But then that would be communication outside of the light cone, okay? So, so, so this really needs to be true in quantum field theory, sort of quantum field theory 101. Um, so um, we'd like to understand, well, so in the bulk, probably the same thing should be true. So say, so say I have a bulk operator here sitting, sitting somewhere in the center, uh, so this phi of x. Well, this bulk operator here, it has the funny property that it's, it's space-like separated in the bulk from every point on this time slice of the boundary, right? This ring at the boundary is a time slice of the boundary. So, um, uh, by, com by commutativity, by causality in the radial direction, you might think that this operator in the center should commute with any local operator in the boundary theory on this time slice. Right? That, that's, that's locality in this emergent radial direction. So if, if there is locality in this emergent radial direction, uh, it, su it suggests that you should have this. Um, but actually, that's impossible. You can't have that. Let's understand why not. Well, the problem is that in a quantum field theory, um, such as the boundary conformal field theory, so here we're talking about the boundary conformal field theory, um, any operator that commutes with all the local operators at a fixed time has to be a trivial operator. Uh, now, okay, that still might not sound intuitive to you, so let, let me explain it in an even simpler system. Consider a chain of poly spins. So, you know, here's whatever, well, I didn't count, but 10 or 12 or something spins going, going around the circle. Um, the Hilbert space is a tensor product of a, a spin one half at each uh, site on the lattice. Um, so this, this, is, this is kind of a model of the CFT, right? These are sort of the local CFT degrees of freedom, but now it's the CFT on a lattice. Um, so in this Hilbert space, the set of all operators on the Hilbert space are generated by products of Pauli operators. You know, so if, you know, for example, Z1, this poly Z on the first one, poly X on the fourth one, 
poly Y on the seventh one, you know, if you take products like that, and then you take superpositions of those products, then you can make every single operator on this Hilbert space. So if you have an operator that commutes with every poly on any one of the, of the spins, then it has to be proportional to the identity because then it commutes with everything. Okay. So, so this is the, this is the, this, this property that you can't have operators that commute with everything local at a fixed time is a basic expression of this local structure of the Hilbert space in, in, in quantum field theory. Um, but okay, then what's going on, right? Because, you know, we, this phi of x here, right? You know, we said it was an operator in the CFT. I mean, we don't think it should be a trivial operator. Certainly, I don't feel like a trivial operator here, and I'm sitting in the center of the bulk. So, so somehow this phi of x has to be non-trivial, despite the fact that it's not allowed to commute with all the local operators at the boundary. Um, okay, but then, if it's not, then what's going on with causality in the radial direction? I thought we wanted to be, have locality in the radial direction. Okay, so this is the paradox. How, how are we going to resolve this? Um, we can illustrate this paradox in another way by using the subregion duality that I mentioned before. Um, so say that O of X up here is your favorite local operator in the boundary theory. I'm sorry I chose your, your favorite local operator for you, but well, I, I, I guess it would have, I, otherwise I would have had to make the figure on the fly. Um, so let's say this is your, I've decided this is your favorite local operator. Um, so, and here's phi of x, which is some, some local operator in the center of the bulk. Now, I can choose, remember I, we had this subregion wedge. I can choose my subregion A to be the boundary of this red thing here. So now you see my A doesn't include the location of this operator O. So if phi here can be represented in the CFT as an operator that's living only here, then it's, it's definitely going to commute with this O of X because their spatial support is different, right? The support of the, the boundary of the red region is space-like separated from this operator in the boundary, so they commute by commutativity of space-like separation. But that's a little funny, because say, you, say, you, say, you, say, say my favorite local operator is down here. Well, then I could have, I could have picked a different wedge. I could, have, I could have picked A going around this way, and then now here's my little geodesic, and this guy is in it, so it has support as an operator here. But then it commutes with that one. Um, and in fact, um, whichever local operator we pick on the boundary, there's a representation of this bulk operator that commutes with it. But again, that seems like it's in tension with the fact we just discussed that you can't have operators that commute with all the local operators. Okay. Now, here's my favorite paradox. This one's even crazier. Um, say we split the boundary into three regions, A, B, and C. Um, so now here I've drawn the little geodesics. I guess here I forgot to shade the wedges red, so now they're gray, but they're the same wedges. Um, well, the funny thing here is this operator is not in the wedge for A, right? Because the little geodesic goes here, right? It's not in the wedge for B, nor in the wedge for C. So I can't represent it on any one of the regions. But the crazy thing is I can represent it on any two of the regions, right? Because if we look at A union B, then the wedge is like this, and now, and now there's the operator. It's in the wedge, and similarly for A, C, or for B, C. So where's the information, right? No single region has access to it, but any two of them do. Okay, so that's kind of weird. Now, for the rest of the talk, I'll be explaining that um, in the last few years, we've understood that these puzzles, and actually many other features of the ADS-CFT correspondence, can be understood by reinterpreting the correspondence as a quantum error correcting code. Now, as with ADS-CFT, I suppose I, I can't assume that you know about quantum error correcting codes. I certainly didn't know about them <laughs> until I started thinking about these things. Um, so let's say a little bit about what quantum error correcting codes are. So quantum error correcting codes were invented by quantum information theorists uh, who were trying to, well, I guess they're not building quantum computers, but they were thinking about how you would build a quantum computer. And the general problem with quantum computers is that um, they like to get decohered by the environment. Uh, and if you're making a quantum computer, that's bad, because the whole point of a quantum 
computer is that you want to preserve the coherence of memory of the quantum computer uh, so that you can do operations on it. So uh, quantum error correcting codes were designed to protect um, the memory for your calculation from decoherence by the environment. Uh, and the basic idea, which I'll illustrate with examples in a sec, is that you want to encode the message, uh, you know, or the, the state that you're computing on, um, non-locally in the entanglement between many degrees of freedom. Sounds, sounds surprising that that should work, um, but it does. Now, there's a general, you know, beautiful theory of, of quantum error correction, which we could talk about, and probably everyone would go to sleep, although it's beautiful, I promise. Um, but instead, we'll just discuss how this works in a few examples. So to be concrete, um, let's say I want to send you a state of a qtrid. Now, what's a qtrid? It's a three-state qubit, OK? So, so here's a three-dimensional, here's a state in a three-dimensional Hilbert space. And I, 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 for whatever reason, you know, I, I'm, in, I'm in Cambridge and you're in Berkeley, and I, I, I really want to send you this state. You know, by that it means I want you know to get, arrange for you and your lab to have a particle uh, in this state. Um, now, um, I could just send it to you in the mail. Uh, I guess it would have to be the quantum post office, but could do it. Um, but you know, well, as you know, right? I mean, you know, in the the U.S. Well, you know, we have the Tea Party and so on, and the post office is not what it used to be. Um, and, well, it's unlikely that the QTRIT would make it to you here. Now, if it were a classical QTRIT, there's an obvious thing to do, which is I just copy it three times and then send you all three copies. OK, and then even if one, one gets screwed up, that's OK. You see that two of them are the same. But that doesn't work quantum mechanically because of the no cloning theorem. I can't copy it three times. So I have to do something more clever. And the more clever thing is uh, I'm going to encode it into a special su three-dimensional subspace uh, of the full 27-dimensional Hilbert space of three QTRIs, right? Because three to the three is 27. And, and I'm, it's called the code subspace and, and with the same coefficients, right? So it's the same state. It's just you know, I use, uh, gi giving it to you in a different Hilbert space. And I can tell you what the basis is. Here's the basis. So, so these are three orthogonal states in the Hilbert space of uh, three QTRIs. And these are the ones I'm going to use. Now, why am I going to use these three? Well, let's first notice some nice properties that they have. Um, well, it's, very, it's symmetric between all three of the QTRITs. That's nice. It makes the system easier to study. Um, and more essentially, all of these states are very entangled right, between, between the QTRITs. And in fact, they're so entangled that um, if you look, if you take any state in the subspace, which is spanned by these three, and you look at the density matrix on any one of the QTRITs, it's maximally mixed. So it has no information about which state uh, you started with. Um, and that's actually good, because it means that then it's possible for you to recover the state from the other two without violating the no cloning theorem. Now let's see how that works in practice. Here's a unitary transformation on two QTRITs. Don't worry about too much about which it is, but I just wanted to show it to you to convince you that it exists. And then if you're bored, you can homework problem check and see it does what I say, I'm about to say it does. What am I going to say it does? Well, the idea is that this has, so I'm, I'm going to view this as acting on the first two, two of the QTRITs, right? It's a two QTRIT unitary transformation. And then the homework problem is you take this unitary and you act it on these states. And what you discover is that after you do that, so this i is like 0, 1, or 2. And then after I act with this, then I get i just on the first QTRIT. And I get this funny state chi on the second two. Now, why is that good? 
Well, say that you um, say that you know I send you the state in the three qtrits and I use the post office uh, and the third qtrit I don't know it falls into the Mississippi River or something uh, you know as the pony is riding across or something. Um, well, that's okay because um, you'll receive the first two and you'll feed them into your quantum computer which you've got lying around and you'll act on them with u12. And after you've done that, hey, look, there's the state. You got it on the first qtrit. And then, okay, you don't have the third one, so you have some maximally mixed state on the second one, but you don't care. You throw it into the trash, and now you've got the state on the first qtrit. And the fun thing is that this works no matter which qtrit you lose, right? Because of the symmetry in the code subspace. If there's a u12, there also has to be a u13 and a u23. So whichever qtrit is lost, as long as only one of them is lost, you can recover the state on the other two, on the two that you do have. Um, so this is kind of reminiscent of this thing we had before with the operator in the center of the bulk and the boundary had three regions and we found that we could represent that operator on any two of the regions. Okay, and, and that, that was kind of the thing that first made me start thinking about this, that these are kind of the same. And in fact, they're more than kind of the same. So, so, so here we were talking about operators, right? So, so here I recovered a state on any two, whereas before we were talking about operators. But, but, but it's easy to rephrase this in terms of operators. So let's see how that works. Um, so say that I have a single qtrit operator O. I don't care what it is. These are its ma it just has some arbitrary matrix elements acting on the Hilbert space of a qtrit. So this j goes from 0, 1, 2. Um, well, I can always find some 3 qtrit operator that acts with the same matrix elements on the code subspace, right? That's pretty easy. Um, but in general, this O tilde might be a complicated operator. You know, if I just pick some stupid code subspace, then if I want to get these matrix elements on the code subspace, this O tilde is probably gonna need to be an operator which acts non-trivially on all three of the qtrits. Um, but, we didn't pick a stupid subspace, we picked a good subspace. So we can do a clever little thing, right? We can, we can define an operator O12, where what it does is at first, at first it acts with this U12, okay? So that, um, that decodes the message. Then while the message is decoded, we just act with O on the first qtrit, because we've decoded the message. And then we re-encode with U12 dagger. And hey, look, this is an operator with support just on one and two, and it acts with these matrix elements on the code subspace. Um, similarly, there will be a O13 and a O23 uh, because I can use U13 and U23. So thus, by using the entanglement in the code subspace, we can reproduce this, this funny thing that we had before, where we had this operator in the center. So now and then we could represent it on any three. So let's make the analogy more explicit. So now my three physical qtrits, right, that I'm using to send the message, correspond to three CFT degrees of freedom in a circle. So here's one, two, and three, the pink things. The code subspace, which is the message, which I'm trying to extend, sometimes called the logical qtrit, corresponds to the point in the bulk here. So this is a very primitive kind of holography, okay? Our boundary has three spatial sites, and our bulk has one spatial site. It's a very, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's the essence of quantum gravity. You have only one point in the bulk. Um, but the good thing about having only one point in the bulk is that even I can understand it. Now, this bulk point you see, well, it's in the subregion wedge of any two of these, right? So, so like here's the, the wedge of these two, here's the geodesic, so then it's there, right? Or here or here. Um, so then indeed I can represent it um, on any two of the boundary qtrits. Uh, so, so the information of what's going on in the center here is rather well protected. Now, so that was paradox number two, right? Remember paradox number two was how do you get this crazy situation where any two of the regions have access the information but any one doesn't. Now we can also get back to paradox number one. Paradox number one, to remind you, was how can you have something that commutes with all the local operators in the boundary given that you can't have something that commutes with all the local operators at the boundary. 
Well, here we can see how to resolve it. So say that phi tilde and psi tilde are two states in the code subspace. O tilde is some operator that acts within the code subspace. So remember, operators acting within the code subspace are bulk operators sitting here in the center. Um, and then x is just some arbitrary operator acting on the third Q-trait. So maybe say here, OK? So x3 is like a local CFT operator here. And O tilde is like a bulk operator there. So remember, by our previous discussion, they should commute because they're at space-like separation in the bulk. Um, and well, indeed, they do. Because O tilde is always acting either to the left or to the right on something in the code subspace. So we can replace it by O12. Remember the ma main claim of O12 here was that it acted like O tilde in the code subspace. Um, but, well, hey, if, if I can rewrite this as O12, then it obviously commutes with this, right? Because this one has support only on the third Q-trit, and O12 has support only on these two, so obviously they commute. Um, so, so you see, we can indeed achieve that O tilde commutes with all the local operators. Um, but the price we pay, the reason why I haven't uncovered for you a contradiction in mathematics, is that we only get the commutator to vanish in this code subspace. All right. The, this commutator will not be zero on the entire Hilbert space. We only get it to be zero on the subspace. But come on, Harlow, what about the rest of the states, right? You know, the, you, you told me that every state in the CFT has a bulk interpretation. And now you're telling me that you're only getting the bulk algebra to work in some of the states. That's not OK, is it? Well. You know, what about, what about all the other states? What about the states that aren't in the code subspace? Isn't, the, isn't ADS CFT supposed to work for them too? Well, oh, that's interesting. Uh, ignore that. Windows 10. Um, well, I claim it's fine. And the reason is that, um, well, the rest of the states do have bulk interpretation, but the bulk interpretation is that. Wow, right to the key punchline too. Uh. All right, is that okay? I guess it's fine. Um, okay, so, so, so the idea is that the rest of the Hilbert space corresponds to states where there's a big black hole here and the point is gone, all right? And that's why gravity is important. Um, you know, it's only because we have gravity in the bulk that we're allowed to have this excuse for letting things work only in a code subspace. Were we doing quantum field theory in the bulk, we would actually need this commutator to, 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 to be zero in all the states. But you see here, in gravity, because we can form a big black hole, this point can fall behind the horizon of the black hole. And if it falls far enough behind, then um, it's not really accessible, even to people who jump into the black hole. Because if they jump in, they hit the singularity before they find it. Um, so, so, so it's gravity that lets us have this point make sense only in the code subspace. Now. OK, that's the simplest example. Now, um, you know, it's, it's nice as far as it goes, but I mean, come on, three q trits, right? I mean, I, I, you know, like, I mean, we're, li we're living in continuous Lorenz invariant space, right? I mean, uh, if this is really right, we should be able to make sense of it in more than just three q trits. Um, we can, um, but let's baby steps. So, Let's stay discrete, but let's just try to get more points in the bulk. So instead of one point in the bulk, let's try to get a volume's worth of points in the bulk. Uh, and as a side bonus, you'll see in a sec we get to draw some pretty pictures. Um, so indeed, there is a generalization of the three q trip model I just discussed, um, where, where it looks more like there is actually a, a whole space sitting there in the bulk. And that was the thing that that we explained here. And then there's also there's a very nice extension of it by these people. So the idea is, uh, well, so previously we replaced the CFT by three Q-trits. So now we're going to be a little more ambitious. And instead, we're going to replace it by n qubits. Uh, and n can be large. So that's getting, God, I'm really not my day. Um, so you know, that's, it's not quite a continuum quantum field theory, but we're doing better. We could, it's something we can imagine trying to take the continuum limit of. Um, we're then going to consider a two to the k dimensional subspace of states. So previously we had a three dimensional code subspace. Now it'll be a two to the k dimensional subspace. Uh, 
And I'm going to describe this subspace to you um, using a tensor network. Uh, I'll say what that is in a sec, although I guess you've probably heard about tensor networks here before. Um, and then the idea is we're going to interpret this subspace of states as sort of being the low energy states, or if you like, the states without a big black hole in them. And it's going to work in the stupidest way possible. So the tensor network is literally just going to give us the wave function of the subspace, right? So we have a two to k dimensional subspace, so I, I can label that by k qubits. And here's its wave function in terms of the, the physical n qubits in the CFT. So I'm just going to give you the wave function. What better way to give you a subspace? Now, this big tensor, though, it's going to be kind of complicated. You see it has a lot of indices. And so the, what the tensor network is going to do is it's going to give us machinery to assemble this tensor. Um, basically, I'm going to build it by taking smaller tensors and then contracting the indices together in various patterns that we'll draw in a sec. But before I do that, let me just quickly say what the little building blocks of my tensor network are going to be. They're going to be something that we call perfect tensors. So. Um, well, what's a perfect tensor? So a perfect tensor is a tensor with two n, oh god, well this, this n has nothing to do with this n, sorry. <laughs> Just has an even number of indices. Um, and uh, each of the indices has the same range. For us it'll be two. Um, but then it's gonna have this funny, it's gonna have this weird property that, that if I split the indices half and half, you know, n here and there, whichever way I split them, it's gonna be a unitary transformation. Okay, so that, that's a rather strong property for a tensor to have. If you just picked a random, ten, well, I shouldn't use the word random, but some, your favorite tensor with uh, two n indices, it probably is not gonna have this property. Um, and in fact, it's not obvious that there are tensors with this property. It's something you have to think about, but there are actually, uh, and basically they're always related to quantum error correcting code, so that's how we were able to find them. Um, and in fact, actually, um, one such perfect tensor we already discussed. It was these three states of the three Qtrit code. So you see here's this I tilde, zero, one, or two, and uh, then there's the three physical Qtrits here. So you can view that subspace as defining a four index tensor. And this is actually a perfect tensor. So any split into two and two gives a unitary transformation from two Qtrits to two Qtrits. So that's an example of a perfect tensor. Homework problem for you to check in. Um, however, that's not the one I'm gonna use. <laughs> I'm instead going to use one with six indices, and indices will run from zero to one, so they'll be qubits instead of qtrits. Uh, and, it, and it's related to some other simple code called the five qubit code. All right, now why do I like the perfect tensors? Well, um, perfect tensors have this nice property that if I have an operator acting on at most half of their indices, I can move it through to a different operator acting on, on the other half of the indices. And you know this is not too complicated, right? I just I the operator on the other side is just I invert this, remembering that it's unitary, and then I put this back. So this is really not that complicated. You know, here's this is some arbitrary operator. Here's my perfect tensor. I can push it through. Um, uh, this doesn't matter too much. Don't worry about that. There, there are isometries. Um, so now here's what here's 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 what we're going to do. Here's our tensor network. <laughs> Remember, we're trying to build a two to the k dimensional subspace of n qubit Hilbert space. So the white dots here on the end are my n physical qubits. So these are like the three qubits in the example. These are the boundary degrees of freedom in the CFT. The red dots are the inputs to the subspace. So they're k of these red dots. So there's a two to the k dimensional subspace. And then what I've done is here is in, in each one of these blue pentagons, I've stuck one of these six index perfect tensors. And then you see I've contracted five of the indices with the neighbors, and then I've left a free one here, which is gonna be the input. And so this picture defines here this, this, this big tensor I was talking about. So these are the white dots, and these are the red dots. Uh, and then I've arranged them in this way where I've tiled the hyperbolic plane with, plane with pentagons. Now, the point is that now I'm gonna use this as a model of ADS-CFT. So you see, previously we had one point in the bulk. Now you see we have a, a red, all these red dots are different points in the bulk. Uh, the CFT now has many white dots, and right, we could even imagine taking a continuum limit and having infinitely many of them. Um, and then this perfect property of the tensors allows us to do quantum error correction, allows us to do subregion reconstruction. 
So, so for example, say I have an operator sitting here in the center of the bulk. So yeah, this is what happens when my collaborator draws the picture, and this is what happens when I draw the picture. So sorry for the notation difference. Um, it's the same picture. These black lines are the legs of the tensors that are contracted, and then you see I have a dangling leg on each of the red dots. Uh, so say I've got an operator acting here. Well, the point is, by using this perfect property of the tensor at the red dot, I can replace this operator by an operator on these three legs. And then I can keep doing that. So I can replace this one by an operator here, and this one by operators here. And by continuing, I can produce an operator with support only on this subregion of the boundary, which acts in the code subspace in the same way that my local bulk operator here would have. And it's non-unique. So say I didn't want to push it here. I could instead push it over here, or up here, or down here. So you see, again, we're pretty well, this guy in the center is pretty well protected from, from erasures, from losing some of the boundary qubits. Uh, similarly, operators that are closer to the boundary, you see I can re represent them in a smaller way. You see, so right, that's like, remember we were drawing these geodesics? So like, say here in this region, the geodesic is kind of like that, so I can represent it there. Here, even if my boundary region is only like this, well, the geodesic is like that, so I can still represent it there. Now, the picture looks similar, but I really want to emphasize how different these things are. When I was drawing those subregions before, I was solving wave equations, you know, partial differential equations, classical partial differential equations in the bulk of anti de Sitter space, okay? And here, we're doing, you know, there's very discrete tensors, you know, very quantum, uh, and we're getting exactly the same phenomenon out. We have these operators, and we can represent them on the boundary, and these. Because you know there's more to the space, you can study this in more detail, and you can see that as the black holes get bigger, their entropy goes like the area, and that eventually they do account for everything else that's not in the code subspace. And so it's really a duality where every state on either side has a physical interpretation. Um, now, okay, we're basically out of time, so I will uh, now move to the conclusion. Um, you know, you can pursue this a lot further. You know, there's general theorems about error correcting codes. Um, and you can use what you know about the physics of the bulk to learn more and more about what kind of error correcting code um, ADS CFT is. Um, obviously, I don't have time to get into all of that today. Probably we've already discussed too many things. Um, but I'll just mention some of the highlights, mostly because they should be familiar. We've already seen them in the examples. First of all, the code of ADS CFT has this nice property that information, which is in the center, is better protected than information which is near the boundary, okay? So for example, say I have this operator near the boundary here. Well, I can represent that just on the boundary of this tiny little red disk here, which means that by polluting just the boundary of this little red disk, I can affect what's going on at this operator. So it's badly protected, right? Even just a tiny little error here is enough to pollute this operator. But this one in the center is much better protected. Even if I do this big, you know, erasure here, I, I do some, you know, the environment comes in and attacks us here, it's still not going to affect what's going on with this operator there. Um, so what one would say is that the radial direction, which remember what we were trying to understand, right, what is the radial direction in ADS CFT, what it measures is it measures how well protected we are. If you're, if you're near the boundary, if the radial direction is large, you're badly protected. And if you're near the center, so the radial coordinate is small, you're well protected. Uh, and, it, and it's fairly clear that it, you know, it monot these are monotonically related. We can also study the question of how big of a code subspace can we have before uh, we stop being able to protect the message. Um, we did already discuss that. Um, and well, what we find in general, as we found in the models, is that right when um, we, you know, we keep trying to include more stuff in the bulk, and right when we think we're not going to be able to do the error correction anymore, uh, a black hole forms. 
So the CFT is really quite sneaky. You know, you come to the CFT and you say, ha, CFT, you tell me that you're a gravity theory in d plus one dimensions, but I know that you're a CFT in d dimensions, and I'm going to catch you lying. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start putting stuff in the bulk. I'm going to put more, and I'm going to put more. And sooner or later, you're going to have to admit that you don't got a volume's worth of degrees of freedom in the bulk because you're a CFT and you're living on the boundary. But then the CFC says, ha, ha, ha. And right when I'm about to catch it, it says, oh, no, now you made a black hole. And uh, you, know, you thought you were going to get a volume's worth of entropy, but actually you're not. You've only got an area's worth. And then the bulk physics agrees with him because it makes a black hole. Um, so now we've come back to our initial discussion, right, about quantum gravity, right? We were discussing defining local observer observables. We had this lattice. We were trying to say where things were, right? And we saw that, indeed, black hole formation was the thing that was preventing us for, from describing local observables. But now we've seen this really very quantitatively in these examples and more generally in the theory of quantum error correction. Um, <coughs> So, so the black holes are really essential. You know, without the black holes, the paradoxes would have been contradictions. So, so it's only because of gravity that a higher dimensional theory can be equivalent to a lower dimensional one. Um, now, there are still many interesting questions, which I didn't discuss and I won't discuss because I don't have time, but I'll just mention briefly one of them, okay, is how far behind the black hole horizon are we able to extend the locality? We've seen eventually it has to break, but, you know, does it break at the horizon? Does it break beyond the horizon? I, I don't know. I'd love to know. Um, so, okay, la um, last slide, so just for fun. Um, so, so far we've been discussing quantum gravity. I'm a quantum gravity person. I care about quantum gravity. Um, but it's interesting to note that the codes we came up with with these networks are actually new codes. They're not codes that quantum information people knew about. So maybe they're good for something. <laughs> you know, and, you know, personally, I would just think it was hilarious if, you know, someday, you know, 20 years from now, you've got your cell phone, your quantum cell phone. Um, and, you know, you, you take it out of your pocket. And the reason why you taking it out of your pocket um, doesn't decohere it um, is because it's simulating quantum gravity in anti disitter space. Um, uh, the engineering application of uh, quantum gravity. All right, so I think I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm wondering if there, there's a way to think about the kind of deep protection of these most internal dimensions as being related to the most correlation. Yeah, that's right. So that that's yeah, so that's definitely true. So so yes, that that is the conventional answer of what the radial direction is, but it's not very quantitative. So you can see here it's basically the same thing, right? So this guy in the center is preserved in this non-local entanglement at large scales. But this guy near the boundary is preserved locally at short distances here. So it, so it is the same relationship between the size of the, the distance scale of things on the boundary and where you are here. But now there's actually an equation, right? You say, if I have an operator at this radius, how big of an error can I, does it take to lose it? And then now it's a, there's a formula. So, so it's more than just sort of saying, oh, it's kind of like the scale, which, which is sort of the conventional picture. Yeah. Yeah, good. That's, so that's a great question. So the issue here is, that, so when I, when I defined the metric on the boundary, I told you it was a round sphere. Um, that, that was way back at the beginning of the talk. Um, here, right? I said this was the metric on the boundary. Now, when I did that, that amounts to choosing a conformal frame because um, in general, you know, you can imagine in a conformal field theory, you're doing vial transformations or conformal, you know, rescaling locally, local rescalings of the metric, and that would change uh, this metric here. It, you know, it wouldn't be round anymore. So by going to the conformal frame where the sphere is round, I've chosen a center. Yeah, but, but I could have chosen another one and then done a conformal transformation to get rid of it. 
Um, but but as long as I pick one, then everything I say is true. And in the in the models like the tensor network, what that corresponds to is when I introduce the cutoff at large radius here. I have again picked a conformal frame where 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 it's sort of uniform. And if I did a conformal transformation, it wouldn't be uniform anymore. Uh, yeah, that, that's also a great question. Um, well, I mean, the short answer is probably no. But see, the main problem with these networks is that the the length of the links here is of order the radius of curvature of the ADS. So, so I, I've kind of lumped everything which is at scales smaller than the ADS radius into into the individual dots. But if you want to take the say the flat space limit and trying to describe you know holography in Minkowski space instead of holography in ADS, then all you care about is what's going on right inside one of these tensors. Um, so, if we could understand that here, then then we could try and take the limit. But I don't have any particularly good ideas about about how to understand that. So no, I, w I wish I could give you a better answer, but I don't think I can at the moment. All right. Well, let's thank Daniel again.